Chicago Chicago is one of the most famous American cities. Some cities in the United States, such as New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, may be more glamorous, but many people agree that Chicago is the city that best represents the United States. Located in the middle of North America, Chicago has derived much benefit from its geography. The city's central location has made its O'Hare International Airport the hub for most airlines in the United States. Its location on the shores of Lake Michigan has made it a major port and business center, where the agricultural and industrial products of the American Midwest are shipped overseas. Until about the 1830s, Chicago was a minor trading post. But then it grew rapidly as the most important town in the rapidly developing areas of the Midwestern United States. In 1871, the city was destroyed by a fire. It is often said that the fire started when a cow knocked over an oil lamp. It took about 20 years for the city to be completely rebuilt, but it continued to expand. In 1882, the first skyscraper was built in Chicago. Around the turn of the century, the population of Chicago was growing quickly. Many African American people moved to Chicago from the southern United States, and many immigrants from Eastern Europe also arrived in Chicago during this time. Because of the busy and active atmosphere of the city, an American poet described Chicago as the city of broad shoulders. Chicago became notorious for organized crime during the Prohibition era of the 1920s, when the sale of alcohol was illegal. Mobsters such as Al Capone became rich by smuggling liquor, and many people were killed in conflicts between rival gangs of criminals. But the influence of organized crime later became weaker. In the decades following World War II, Chicago experienced some problems with crime, poverty, and racial conflict. However, the city has recently prospered, and social conditions have improved for many people in Chicago. Compared with other large cities, Chicago is viewed as an affordable place to live with a high quality of life. The city has efficient transportation and many beautiful parks along the Lake Michigan shoreline. Chicago is famous for its many attractions, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the Field Museum of Natural History, the Shedd Aquarium, the Sears Tower, and the Miracle Mile Shopping District. Indeed, Chicago is one of the most interesting cities in the United States. Women and the right to vote. In most countries today. People think it is obvious that all adults should have the right to vote in democratic elections, but it was not so long ago that women did not have this right. Only after a long struggle did women gain the right to vote. By the early 19th century, modern democratic forms of government were appearing in the United States, Great Britain, and some European countries. In these countries, most adult men had the right to vote in democratic elections. Some men were denied this right if they were poor or if they belonged to a racial minority group, but gradually this right was extended to all men. It took much longer for women to gain the right to vote. Only in special cases, such as that of a widow who owned land, could a woman be allowed to vote. Many men believed that it was not necessary for women to vote because they assumed that the husband should decide on behalf of his wife. Some men believed that women did not possess the intelligence or the discipline to vote carefully. Some women also believed that women should not be involved in politics, but many others wanted the right to vote. By about the year 1850, some women began to organize in an effort to change the laws regarding women and the vote. This movement was known as the woman suffrage movement. Because the word suffrage means voting, leaders such as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton brought attention to this issue and persuaded many people that women should vote. 
The first part of the United States to recognize women's right to vote was Wyoming in the year 1869. During the following decades, many other states recognized women's right to vote, particularly in the western part of the country, where women had a high social status. However, the United States was not the first country to recognize women's right to vote at the national level. The first country to recognize women's right to vote was New Zealand in 1893. Soon after, Australia also allowed women to vote, and so did the Scandinavian countries of Northern Europe. But in countries such as the United States, Canada, and Great Britain, women could not yet vote. Women in those countries struggled to gain the vote. For example, in Great Britain, Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters participated in hunger strikes. During World War I, 1914 to 1918, women's work efforts were very important to winning the war, and people's attitudes were increasingly in favor of women having the right to vote. Women then gained the right to vote in Canada, the United States, and Great Britain. Gradually, other democracies around the world also recognize women's right to vote. Today, it seems difficult to believe that women were not allowed to vote only a few generations ago, but there is still progress to be made. In most countries, women are underrepresented among political leaders. Perhaps the day will soon come when women are elected as often as men. Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens is considered one of the greatest writers in the history of English literature. Dickens wrote his many novels during the 19th century, but those novels remain popular even today. Literary experts admire his genius at describing the lives and personalities of the many characters in his books. Charles Dickens was born in England in 1812. His father was a clerk who worked for the navy. Unfortunately, his father was not good at managing money, and the family soon went deeply into debt. In those days, people who owed money were sent to prison, and their families were sent to places called workhouses. When Charles's father was unable to pay the debts, Charles was sent to a workhouse where he had to work long hours, and Charles's father was sent to prison. After a few years, the family regained its freedom, but the experience had a lasting effect upon Charles. As a young man, Charles Dickens worked as a journalist in the law courts and in Parliament, but he soon began writing stories for newspapers. These stories were very popular with the readers. Soon, Dickens began writing entire novels for the newspapers. Each month, the newspaper would publish another chapter of Dickens' latest novel. One of Dickens' most famous early novels is called *Oliver Twist*. This is the story of a young man who is poor and alone in the city of London, and becomes involved in criminal activities to support himself. The characters in this novel have a very wide range of personalities, but seem very real to the reader. The book exposed the conditions that faced the poor people of London and helped to encourage reforms aimed at improving those conditions. Perhaps Dickens' most popular novel is *A Christmas Carol*. In this story, a rich but stingy old man, Ebenezer Scrooge, refuses to give his employee a day off at Christmas and refuses to donate money to help the poor. But while sleeping, Scrooge is visited by ghosts from his past, present, and future. These ghosts show Scrooge how badly he has behaved. When Scrooge wakes up, he becomes a kind and generous man who fully appreciates the spirit of the Christmas holiday. Another famous novel of Dickens is *A Tale of Two Cities*. This is a story of the violence and upheaval during the French Revolution. The story is famous for the heroic act of sacrifice that is made by one character for the benefit of the others. Dickens was famous as a public speaker, and large crowds assembled to hear his performances. When he died in 1870, he was a very famous man. The novels of Charles Dickens allow the reader to experience the life of 19th-century London.
showing the poverty and injustice that were so common. The characters of these novels show the range of human behavior, from cruelty and selfishness to kindness and love. It is no surprise that Dickens is viewed as one of the great figures of English literature. Samuel Clemens or Mark Twain. Mark Twain was the author of some of the greatest works of American English literature, such as Tom Sawyer, Life on the Mississippi, and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Mark Twain's real name was Samuel Langhorn Clemens. He used Mark Twain as his pen name. Samuel Clemens was born in the American state of Missouri in 1835. As a child, he enjoyed many outdoor activities, such as swimming and fishing. When Samuel was 11 years old, his father died, and he began working to help support his family. As a young man, Samuel Clemens began to write stories for newspapers. However, he took a job working as a navigator on the steamboats that traveled up and down the Mississippi River. Clemens greatly enjoyed this period of his life, during which time he gained much knowledge about life on the river. He also learned much about human behavior by observing the many people on the boats and along the river. It was as a result of this time that Clemens began using his pen name, Mark Twain. This name is taken from a term that was used by the men who worked on the river. It is used to describe water that is just deep enough to be navigated safely. The earliest of Mark Twain's really famous novels was *The Adventures of Tom Sawyer*. This novel describes a boy who engages in much mischief, but who has a kind heart. The story contains several scenes that are quite funny. In one of these, Tom's working at the boring task of painting a fence. He persuades several other boys to help him by pretending that painting the fence is a fun and enjoyable activity. Another famous novel by Mark Twain was *Life on the Mississippi*. This book describes many interesting characters similar to those that Twain actually observed while working on a steamboat. This story gives the reader a vivid image of the people who lived and worked along the Mississippi River. Probably the best novel by Mark Twain was *The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn*. This novel tells the story of a boy who runs away from his violent father. The boy, whose name is Huckleberry Finn, is joined in his escape by a man named Jim. Jim is a slave who has decided to run away from his owners. Huck and Jim travel north along the Mississippi, hoping to reach the areas where slavery is not allowed. In this story, the reader can experience the moral sense of Huckleberry, who must make several important decisions during the escape. Mark Twain died in 1910 after writing many more novels and many stories of his travels around the world. Twain's works are still widely read today. His books are appreciated for their humor, for their interesting descriptions of life in 19th century America, and for showing both the good and evil that people can do. Many critics consider Twain to have been the greatest American writer. The Islands of the Caribbean. The Caribbean Sea is the large body of water that lies north of the northern tip of South America. Within the Caribbean Sea are many islands that have played an important role in the history and culture of the Western Hemisphere. By far, the largest island in the Caribbean is Cuba. Cuba was formerly a colony of Spain, but became independent in 1902. Cuba became a communist country in 1959 when a revolution overthrew an unpopular government. After the revolution, many Cubans fled to the United States. Today, the American city of Miami in the state of Florida has been greatly influenced by Cuban culture. Tobacco is widely grown in Cuba, and the country is famous for the cigars that are produced in the capital city, Havana. The island of Hispaniola is located just east of Cuba. This island is divided into two countries. In the west is Haiti, where the people speak a variety of the French language that has been influenced by African languages. 
In the east is the Dominican Republic, where the people speak Spanish. Another important Caribbean island is Puerto Rico. This was previously a Spanish colony, but is now governed by the United States. Many people from Puerto Rico have moved to the mainland United States, especially the New York area. In many other islands in the Caribbean, English is the main language. The largest of these islands is Jamaica, which is located just south of Cuba. Most Jamaicans are the descendants of African people who were brought to work as slaves on sugar plantations. Jamaica is famous as the birthplace of the style of music called reggae, which was popularized in other countries by Bob Marley, a famous Jamaican musician. Another important English-speaking Caribbean island is Trinidad. This island is located just north of South America. The population of Trinidad is very diverse. The largest groups of people are descended from people who came from Africa and India, but there are many other nationalities also. Trinidad is famous for a style of music known as calypso, and for musicians who produce pleasant sounds by playing steel drums. There are also many other smaller islands in the Caribbean, each with its own unique features. Many of these islands possess fine beaches and are popular tourist destinations. The warm weather of the Caribbean makes it a popular place for North Americans who must live through cold winters. North American Indians. The first people who lived in North America were the Indians. The name Indians is actually not very accurate. Because the people are not from India, but when the first Europeans came to North America, they mistakenly believed that they had reached India, so they referred to the people as Indians. In different parts of North America, the Indians had very different cultures and very different ways of making a living. On the west coast of North America, many large rivers flow into the Pacific Ocean. In these rivers is an abundance of fish, such as salmon. The Indians in these areas obtained much of their food by fishing. They lived in settled villages and became experts in carving wood from the tall trees of the area. They carved large canoes for traveling on the rivers and oceans, and they also carved tall totem poles. Totem poles were carvings of various animal or human figures, and often the poles had a mythical or spiritual significance for the people who carved them. Many beautiful totem poles can be seen in cities such as Vancouver or Victoria, in the Canadian state of British Columbia, or Seattle in the American state of Washington. The Plains Indians lived in the central prairie of North America. The various nations of the plains lived by hunting large animals called buffalo or bison. Horses were brought to North America in the 16th century by the Spanish. The Indians who lived in the prairie areas had learned to become experts at riding horses, and on horseback they could hunt the giant herds of bison. They followed the buffalo from place to place. The Plains Indians lived in portable houses called teepees, which were made by sewing together buffalo skins and holding them in place with wooden poles. In the southwestern United States, some Indians lived by farming. In this dry area, the Indians raised several crops, such as corns, beans, and squash. Many of the Indians in these areas lived in large settlements where the houses were made from stone or dried mud. The people were experts at weaving, and they made clothing and blankets that had beautiful artistic designs. Near the eastern coast of North America, many Indians lived by a combination of farming and hunting. These people lived in fortified villages, some of which were inhabited for many years at a time. In some places, they built large earthworks that can still be seen today. In the forests of northern Canada, the Indians lived primarily by hunting, fishing, and gathering. Like the Indians of the prairie regions, they often moved from place to place in search of game animals to hunt. Today, the Indians of North America no longer live in their traditional ways. However, several Indian languages are still spoken by many thousands of people. 
Also, many Indians in the United States and Canada are very interested in maintaining the cultural traditions of their ancestors. How the First World War Started During the summer of 1914, many people in Europe felt very optimistic about the future. Modern technology was improving people's lives. Political freedom was gradually increasing in many countries. New artistic styles and scientific discoveries were being made. But later that summer, a terrible war began. In the early 20th century, the various countries of Europe competed with each other in an attempt to be the most powerful country on the continent. In each country, many of the political leaders wanted to control more land, more people, and more resources. The First World War began when the Archduke of Austria Hungary was assassinated. Austria Hungary wanted to punish the assassin, who was from the small country of Serbia. This led to a serious dispute, and soon other countries were involved. Within a few weeks, a war had begun. On one side were Germany and Austria Hungary, and on the other side were Russia, France, and Britain. Many people were intensely patriotic and supported the war effort without thinking carefully about the reasons for the war. Some people thought that war would bring adventure and glory to their lives, and they cheered enthusiastically in the streets. After the war started, it soon became clear that it was a terrible disaster. In the western part of Europe, the opposing sides fought many bloody battles. Soldiers on both sides lived in filthy trenches that had been dug out of the ground. Sometimes hundreds of thousands of men were killed in battles that lasted only a few days. In most cases, these battles did not result in large gains or losses of territory. The war continued for more than four years. When the war was finally over, millions of people had been killed. Many people realized that their eagerness to fight against other countries had led them into a great disaster. This disaster did not end when the war ended in 1918. During the next 30 years, there would be many violent revolutions in Europe and a second major war that would be even worse than the first. Today, people in most European countries no longer view other nations as enemies. They have no interest in fighting wars with their neighbors. Instead, they're interested in trading with the other countries and in visiting those countries as tourists. The lessons of the 20th century have reminded people that wars can have terrible consequences. Abraham Lincoln When historians are asked to choose the greatest presidents in the history of the United States, one of the names most frequently mentioned is Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was president during the greatest ordeal that ever faced the United States, the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln was born in 1809 in the state of Kentucky, but when he was a child, the family moved to the state of Indiana. Abraham's parents, Thomas and Nancy Lincoln, were farmers who were very poor, and they received only a few years of education. When Abraham was only nine years old, his mother became ill and died. About one year later, Abraham's father remarried. As a young man, Abraham continued to work on the family farm, and he also worked as a laborer. During this time, the Lincolns moved to the state of Illinois. Abraham became known to the local people as an excellent athlete and storyteller. He educated himself by reading many books, most of which he borrowed from neighbors. Lincoln was interested in politics, and when he was in his mid-twenties, he was elected to the Illinois State Legislature. During that time, Lincoln also studied law and soon became known as an excellent lawyer. People called Lincoln Honest Abe because of his personal integrity. In 1842, Lincoln married a woman named Mary Todd. During the 1850s, Lincoln became strongly opposed to the expansion of slavery into the western parts of the United States. Lincoln held several famous debates against a supporter of slavery named Stephen Douglas. In 1860, Lincoln was a candidate in the election for President of the United States. During this election, the issue of slavery and its expansion was very prominent. Lincoln won, but soon after, several of the southern states decided to secede from the United States and form their own country. 
A few months later, fighting started between those southern states and the federal government, which was supported by the northern states. Lincoln managed the Civil War with skill and determination. Gradually, the North began to win the war. In 1863, Lincoln made the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves. Later that year, Lincoln gave his most famous speech, the Gettysburg Address. The Civil War had brought terrible suffering to many Americans, and people were very bitter after the war. But Lincoln wanted the country to become united again, and he urged people to forgive. However, However, in April of 1865, only months after the war ended, Lincoln was shot and killed by an assassin. Many people, even Lincoln's critics, mourned his death. In the generations that have passed since Lincoln's death, he has continued to be viewed as a great president. Some historians have criticized Lincoln for not being more strongly opposed to slavery, but others have defended him saying that Lincoln's approach to the issue was realistic and humane. But nearly all historians agree that Lincoln was an honest and brave leader during the most difficult period in American history. Two great musicians, Mozart and Beethoven. Much of the music of 18th and 19th century Europe is still enjoyed by many people. Two of the greatest musicians of that time were born only 34 years apart and actually knew each other for a short time. These great musicians were Mozart and Beethoven. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was born in Austria in the year 1756. As a child, Mozart was a music prodigy. He began composing music before his fifth birthday, and by the time he reached his teenage years, Mozart had already written many symphonies and other musical works. As a young man, Mozart worked as a concertmaster for the Archbishop of Salzburg in Austria. He also traveled to various European cities. When he was in his mid-twenties, Mozart moved to the city of Vienna. Mozart had difficulty earning a living, but during this time he wrote some excellent operas and string quartets. Many people did not yet appreciate the greatness of Mozart's music. In his early 30s, Mozart became the court musician for the Emperor of Austria, and during the next few years, Mozart continued to write many beautiful works of music. Mozart died in 1791, but although his life was short, his productivity had been enormous. The beauty, grace, and technical precision of his music is still greatly admired, and he is considered one of the greatest musicians of all time. When Mozart was in Vienna, he met a young musician named Ludwig van Beethoven. Beethoven performed some music for Mozart, who was greatly impressed by the talent of this young man. Beethoven had been born in Germany in 1770, and from an early age he had displayed a great aptitude for music. Beethoven moved permanently to Vienna in 1792. He studied music under some famous composers and became known for his outstanding skill in playing the piano. Beethoven began to compose more of his own music, and these works became very popular. When in his late twenties, Beethoven began to lose his hearing. He continued to compose excellent music, but he became more withdrawn and performed less frequently. By the year 1817, Beethoven had become completely deaf, and he could no longer perform music. However, his creative genius did not deteriorate. Instead, Beethoven created many of his greatest works, despite his deafness. It was Beethoven's influence that began the Romantic era of music, which followed the Classical era of the 19th century. Beethoven died in 1827, but his music remains famous for its beauty and originality. His greatest symphonies, such as the Fifth Symphony, are among the world's best-known works of music. Today, the works of Mozart and Beethoven are still popular among those who appreciate great music. Music fans can look back with wonder at the musical creativity that flourished in Vienna more than two centuries ago. Amelia Earhart 
Amelia Earhart was one of the most famous airplane pilots of all time. She is famous for the impressive travels that she made in her airplane, for the mystery surrounding her death, and for showing that women could perform great feats of aviation. Amelia Earhart was born in the American state of Kansas in the year 1897. After graduating from high school, Earhart decided to become a nurse. She worked as a military nurse in Canada during World War I, treating injured soldiers. After the war, she returned to the United States and became a social worker. But in 1920, she saw airplanes in a stunt flying exhibition, and early the next year, she took her first ride in an airplane. It was then that Amelia Earhart decided to become a pilot. Within a few months, Earhart saved her money and bought a small airplane. She flew frequently and improved her skills as a pilot. In 1928, she joined two men in a flight across the Atlantic Ocean. But Amelia Earhart's greatest exploits were still to come. In May 1932, she attempted to become the first woman to fly solo. Or alone across the Atlantic Ocean, she flew east from the island of Newfoundland and faced cold weather, high winds, and dense fog. But she successfully crossed the ocean and landed her airplane in a farmer's field in Ireland. When news of her flight reached the United States, Amelia Earhart had become very famous. Later flights by Amelia Earhart were equally impressive. She became the first person to fly from Hawaii to California across four thousand kilometers of Pacific Ocean. She also became the first person to fly from Mexico City to the New York City area. But in 1937, she planned her most ambitious flight: a journey around the world. On June first, nineteen thirty-seven, Amelia Earhart took off from Miami, Florida. She was accompanied by her navigator, Fred Noonan. They flew east, making stops along the way. Within one month, they had flown across three quarters of the globe, reaching the Pacific island of New Guinea. On July second, Earhart and Noonan took off from New Guinea, flying toward Howland Island. This very small island was over four thousand kilometers from New Guinea and was very difficult to find in the middle of the vast ocean. During this flight, Earhart and Noonan were in radio contact with some ships from the U.S. Navy. However, bad weather made it impossible to see the stars at night, so navigation was very difficult, and the plane became lost. Earhart and Noonan never arrived at Howland Island. The U.S. Navy undertook a massive search, but they never found the lost airplane. Earhart and Noonan had been lost at sea. Amelia Earhart's death was a great tragedy, but she had lived an exciting life that was full of achievements. She had helped to show that very long flights could be made and that women could perform feats of flying that were equal to those of men. Even today, many people are inspired by the courage and endurance of Amelia Earhart.